In this video, I've traveled to the China Aviation Museum just north of Beijing to show you two of only three Tupolev Tu-4s in existence anywhere in the world. These reverse-engineered Boeing B-29 Superfortresses were sold to the Chinese, who upgraded the engines to turboprops amongst other things, and in this video, I'm going to tell you more about these fascinating aircraft and this chapter in aviation history. I'm Paul Stewart, and I make videos about planes and one car. This includes guided tours around interesting aircraft in museums and onboard flights around the world. If you're into these types of videos, then please check out my channel and subscribe. We all know that artificial intelligence is wrecking YouTube, so please support videos like this, made by real humans and real ab geeks, by commenting and giving the video a thumbs up. Now let's begin with some history. In the 1940s, the Soviet Union was in desperate need to develop a strategic bomber similar to what Western allies were operating. They had been using their four-engine 1930s design Petlikov PE-8 during the war, but it was complicated and rapidly becoming obsolete. They approached the USA to lease their B-29s, but were politely told no, especially after their 1941 neutrality pact signed with Japan didn't suggest that they were going to be the most helpful ally themselves. They also declined to allow the US to launch B-29 attacks from the USSR against Japan, likely prolonging the war itself. So Soviet leader Joseph Stalin ordered that they design their own strategic bomber that could deliver a nuclear bomb. Given the big budget and a clean sheet of paper, Soviet engineers excitedly began work on the Aircraft 64 program to make the best high altitude long range four engine bomber that they could and his early models. During 1944, four American B-29s made emergency landings on Soviet territory and because of the Soviet Union's neutrality pact with the Japanese, the B-29s and their crew were interned for the duration of the war. The US demanded that they be returned, but the Soviets said no, and instead three of them were flown to Moscow and given to the Tupolev design team. One was dismantled, another used for in-flight testing and crew training, and the third was left as a spare to double-check everything. There were multiple different B-29 factories within the United States, and they all had slight differences in the aircraft that they produced, so the Soviets were kept busy and confused by the minor disparities between them. Andrei Tupolev was summoned to meet with Stalin, and he excitedly took all of the Aircraft 64 plans with him. To his horror, Stalin was only interested in the B-29 and demanded that they make an exact copy. Tupolev insisted that he could make a better aircraft, or at least improve aspects of the B-29, which itself was designed in the late 1930s and early 1940s and rushed into production. Stalin said no, as it had to be an exact copy and get out of the room. The program was called the B-4, and they were given 12 months to copy everything and then another 12 months to get 20 of them into the air. Now it was not going to be a simple feat, as even the measuring units had to be converted from imperial to metric. For example, the B-29 skin was 1 16th of an inch thick, but that was converted to 1.5875 millimeters, which was an awkward number, so instead they had to use skin that was either 0.8 or 1.8 millimeters thick, depending on the location. Stalin was insistent on it being an exact copy, but that led to conflict with Tupolev, who still, and probably rightly, believed that modifications could be made to improve the aircraft. They could potentially include technology already used by the Soviets, that would aid in the developmental process. For example, the decision to use Soviet-made parachutes was a lengthy process but ultimately required endorsement by high-ranking generals rather than an engineer. Instead of installing Soviet IFF, which stands for Identification of Friend or Foe Systems, they installed an exact copy of the American system, but then it would appear like an American aircraft. This intense following of the rules, which was understandable since Stalin was known to imprison or kill anyone who didn't follow his orders, which led to a lot of seemingly bizarre decisions being made. Eventually they did fit Soviet IFF systems, but after a huge waste of time and money. Another problem that they had was translating the flight and engineering manuals. An especially amusing story was the difficulties they had with the pre-flight checks, which made reference to starting a putt putt. Translators had no idea what it was, and apparently it wasn't until the first engine run that they discovered that it was in fact the auxiliary power unit, which we know colloquially as the putt-putt by Americans because of the noise it made. When the Soviets turned it on, they heard the putt-putt sound, and it all made sense. 
the Tu-4 first flew on the 19th of May 1947 and was first seen by NATO nations at the Toshino Aviation Day Parade on the 3rd of August the same year. Teasing the Western observers, they flew three of these over, knowing that they'd assumed that they were the three that had been interned there. But minutes later, another one arrived to show that the Soviets had instead reverse-engineered them. In 1949, the Tu-4, which was now given the NATO designation the Bull, entered service with the Soviet Air Force as a long-range bomber. It had the range to deliver an atomic bomb to any European capital city or from the eastern side of the USSR to Japan, Korea and remote parts of Alaska, but not anywhere else on the mainland USA other than on a one-way suicide mission. By 1954, the strategic bomber role transferred to the Tu-16 and later the Tu-95. On the 28th of February 1953, Stalin provided China with 10 Tu-4s and later in 1960, two more were sent and used as navigational training aircraft. Apparently these were used in a riot suppression role over the Tibetan Plateau, in the Sino-India border war and even bombing the frozen Yellow River to open it up to ships during winter. The original B-29s had 18-cylinder Wright R-3350 engines, but the Soviets replaced them with Seventsov ASH-73 engines, which was an 18-cylinder air-cooled radial manufactured in the USSR from 1947 until 1957. It was a licensed and modified version of the Wright R-1820 Cyclone. We know that the B-29's biggest problem was the engines, and that was mostly rectified with the B-50 upgrade, and these Soviet engines were equally as problematic. The reality was that the Tu-4 was outdated by the time it entered service, as you must remember that when it first flew in 1947, the Americans were test flying the radical, swept wing and jet powered B-47. So one quick way of modernising the Tu-4 was swapping the engines for turboprops. From the 1960s, 11 of the Chinese Tu-4s were retrofitted with AI-20K turboprop engines, which the Chinese designated the WJ-6s and these were shared with Antonov AN-12 and Aleutian IL-18 airliners. These were almost double the power, producing 4,250 horsepower each instead of the 2,400 from the older piston engines. I must also mention that engine number 2 and 3 appear different, as you can see here, because remember the main landing gear folds up into their nacelle. Because the turboprop engines were larger than the piston engines, they couldn't simply be installed into the existing nacelle, so they had to be redesigned and they were now positioned 2,300 centimetres forward. This obviously had a major effect on the centre of gravity, so they had to increase the horizontal stabiliser size and they also had to install these fins on the ends and this ventral fin underneath to improve in-flight stability. Another complication of the engine swap was that the props now spun in the opposite direction and the prop wash was now hitting the fin and causing a slight rightward drift. And by the way, look at the size of these turboprop engine exhausts. While it may not have been much, these would have helped produce a small amount of lift as well. Looking at the tail gunner's position here, and obviously without access to the American Browning 50 cal machine gun, the revolutionary remote control gun turret system was modified to fit the much larger and more powerful Soviet 23mm cannons instead. Both the Soviet bombs and bullets were different to that used by the Americans, so the sights would have need modification, so it's unclear how accurate the targeting systems would have been. I mentioned the IFF system before, which was later upgraded to a Soviet one for obvious reasons, and the radio communication system was updated from the B-29s to a system found in a newer B-25 Mitchell that also landed in the USSR. Another approved change by Stalin was the wet wing tanks from the B-29 being replaced by more traditional flexible fuel tanks within the wing. Now I have to mention this large dish on top of the fuselage that we see here. Now there's conflicting reports if this is the original or a mock-up, but this is the only KJ-1 prototype in existence anywhere in the world. The idea was that a radar that was airborne and mobile and also looking from a higher position gave it a much greater range that it could observe, and it would have been the equivalent of 40 ground-based radar stations. Early detection of incoming enemy aircraft meant that their defence could be ready by the time they arrived. It was the first generation AEW, which stands for the Airborne Early Warning Aircraft, built by the Chinese and based on the Tu-4. Started in 1969, Project 926 was fitted 
with a Type 843 Rotodome on top, but early test flights revealed in-flight vibrations that they were unable to resolve. There were also failures in the Soviet and Chinese-made electronic components, and apparently the 12 crew members were poorly protected from the radiation. Then changing priorities within China resulted in the program being paused, and eventually the aircraft was scrapped. Instead, China went on to develop the Phased Array Radar for their own KJ-2000, which itself was a modified Soviet Aleutian IL-76. Attached under the wing here is the Wu Zen 5, which was an unmanned reconnaissance vehicle that was a reversed engineered copy of the American AQM 34N Fire B, which had crash landed or been shot down and subsequently photocopied. These were initially launched from the Tu 4 and then the newer YE 8, which was based on the Soviet Un 12 and entered service in 1980. Once launched in flight, the WP turbojet engines would ascend it up to around 57,000 feet take the photos, and then return to near where it launched and descend to the ground via a parachute. After the jet-powered Tu-16 took over the strategic nuclear role, the Soviets looked at other ways to keep the Tu-4s employed, and one idea was the Tu-4NM, a target drone launcher. Six were stripped of their unnecessary equipment and converted to carry LA-17 turbojet-powered target drones. Unfortunately, they struggled with the additional weight, making the plan unfeasible, and the LA-17 was instead launched by ground-based rockets. Often overlooked is the important role that the Tu-4 played in the Soviet atomic bomb program. Not only did Stalin want a big bang, but that bang needed to be moved, and he was insistent on the B-29 being the perfect vehicle for that, as it was proven to work over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and as I said before, the Soviets didn't have anything else that was similar and production-ready. The first Soviet freefall atomic bomb, called RDS-1, was sensitive to temperature changes and it was feared that the sub-zero temperatures at altitude could inactivate it. Therefore, modified Tu-4As were built with electrically heated bomb bays and on the 18th of October 1951, the first airdropped RDS-3 was successfully detonated with a yield of over 41 kilotons, which was almost three times the power of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. The Soviets now had a proven atomic bomber. The Soviet Navy flew 50 Tu-4K variants, and they operated two KS-1 Comet anti-ship missiles attached to pylons between the engines. These were the Soviet Union's first air-to-surface missile, and in many ways, it looked like a MiG-15 fighter jet, but without the cockpit. It was powered by a reverse-engineered British Rolls-Royce Derwent turbojet called the Klimov RD-500K. The first part of the trip was guided via an inertial navigation system, while a semi-active radar system, which you can see positioned here in the nose, would direct it on its final stage, delivering a 600kg warhead. It had a range of around 100km, flew at Mach 0.9, and they were withdrawn from service in 1969. Apparently during the Korean War, the Soviets looked at deploying these Tu-4Ks and attacking American, British and Australian warships around Korea, but thankfully that never eventuated. Only one prototype was made, but the Tu-4T had a modified bomb bay where up to 42 paratroopers or other weapons or supplies could be transported. Other better transporting options appeared, so this program was cancelled. The Tu-4LL flying testbed was used during the development of the Tu-91, which itself was a cancelled two-seat Soviet attack aircraft, initially designed to be operated from aircraft carriers. As you can see, engine number three was replaced with the Tu-91's 8,000 horsepower Kuznetsov TV-2 turboprop engine, which funnily enough, made more power than the other three piston engines combined. It also had the cockpit positioned behind it. The Tu-4D had these storage pods underneath the wings that could carry cargo or troops, who could then be paradropped or have a regular landing and then be offloaded on the ground. The pods could carry up to 1600 kilograms, which could include a light vehicle or artillery. When production ceased in 1952, around 1000 Tu-4s had been built. They first went into service in 1948 and were retired by the USSR in 1960. The Chinese retired their last Tu-4s in 1988. Of interest, a modified version of the Tu-4 with a much longer range was planned. The Tu-80 was planned to have upgraded engines, more fuel tanks, and improved aerodynamics, but it was instead cancelled in favour of the Tu-85. 
That itself was then cancelled in favour of the Tu-95 Bear, which remains in service with the Russian military to this day. In many ways it seemed like the Tu-80 was like the Boeing B-50 and then the B-54 programs, which were desperately trying to address the reality that this was a fundamentally old plane operating in a time when aircraft design was leaping forward at an incredible pace. While they were lagging in the West, even the Soviets were moving ahead quickly with the jet-powered bombers like the Tu-16 and even the turboprop Tu-95 I've already mentioned. While the Tu-4 did allow the Soviets to save face and get a strategic bomber very quickly, the problem with simply copying other designs is that it stifles innovation and while they had just caught up, well barely, the West was moving forward at a rapid pace with aircraft like the B-47, B-52 and the B-58. Aircraft like the XB-70 and the SR-71 were mind-blowing designs and could have never come from such a restrictive culture. The whole story highlights the importance of encouraging innovation and critical thinking. And no, this isn't a segue into product placement, it's just true, well, in my opinion. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and check out my channel for many more similar videos. And thanks for watching.